All right. Well, why don't we get started? I know some more people are still entering the room, but uh, I, I'm very excited to pass it over to Sabina Galt, who is a Naturally New York board member and CEO of Connect Agency. And we are also here with Justin Wong from Alliance Consumer Growth, who is also a founding partner of Naturally New York. So thank you for your contributions there as well. Um, I will kick it off to you guys to get started. Awesome. Sabina. Well, Thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, we're uh, kind of taking a little bit of an interesting uh, topic and, and making, it, uh, making it work because there's so much synergy between uh, capital and marketing, where you're taking your capital and um, how much marketing you're doing with it. Um, and when there's lack of that, uh, then, uh, then likely marketing is likely taking a back seat. So, um, uh, Justin, thanks for joining today. Excited to to do this together. Of course, happy to join. Nice to nice to see everyone this morning. Same. Um, so we'll dive right in. Um, I think we'll do questions at the end. But if there's something that is um, uh, very important, or you feel like you want a clarification right then and there, please, you know, put it in the chat. Adrian is going to be watching it uh, closely, and you know, she'll stop us as we go along and. Uh, we can answer the question. Um, so first things first, um, a little bit about us. I'm, I'm Sabina Galt. I run Connect. Um, we're a full service agency with offices in New York, LA, um, Chicago, Denver, and Oklahoma City. Long story as to why that, but here we are. Um, we do everything from creative public relations crisis, onto crisis, um, as well as uh, um, social media influencer, kind of everything you can think about in the marketing funnel. Um, been around for almost 20 years. Um, our agency is uh, unofficially 18, uh, officially 15 this year, uh, and uh, have about 60 or so employees around the country, and uh, have been part of the building block of many brands that uh, you're all familiar with, whether they're on the shelves of Whole Foods, Time, or Amazon, whether it's a layered superfoods or a one bar protein bar or vital proteins or Maple Hill, um, Roar, you name it, we've likely done it. So that's us, that's me. Um, I'm here to talk on the marketing side and I'll let uh, Justin introduce himself. Great, hi everyone. So I'm Justin Wong. I'm a vice president at Alliance Consumer Growth uh, or ACG. We're a growth equity firm that's focused on finding the most promising emerging consumer brands across all big and important consumer categories. So food, beverage, beauty, personal care, pet, apparel, a little bit of restaurants and retail as well. And so we sit you know, somewhere between the worlds of venture capital and buyout where we're providing minority growth equity to brands as well as you know, partnership and resources to help great brands grow and scale. So we've been around for almost 15 years. Uh, we're now investing out of our fifth bond and we've been lucky enough to be uh, part of brands from, you know, Shake Shack and Crave Jerky and Bark Thins in the early days. And we're current investors in brands you, you likely know, like Harry's and Skims and Blaze Pizza and Athletic Brewing. Um, so, so that's a bit about us and how we think about the consumer world. We have uh, two offices in, in New York uh, and L.A. I'm actually based in the L.A. office, um, but I joined ACG originally in 2018 um, and spend my time on everything from sourcing to new investment execution and then support, you know, a variety of our partner companies across industries. That's a... So why are, why, why are we talking about this? Um, because ultimately we believe that everybody in this industry wants to become a household name brand. Um, and yes, some of these uh, are very well known. Some of them, um, you know, have had a incredible legacy. Um, but ultimately, I think both Justin and I really have front row seats at several hundred businesses at all times. And um, the truth is that some of those tactics that that work for one brand don't necessarily work for another. Um, and what you're doing with the Coke, you're not necessarily doing with a life water or with a vitamin water. And likely what you're doing with a Kraft mac and cheese, you're not doing with, uh, you know, a Lay's baked potato chips. And it's not just because they're different products. It's because they truly have a different trajectory in their growth. They have a different 
way of approaching marketing. They have a different consumer demographic that they're actually reaching to. Um, and then they have a different inflection point that the consumer is interacting with that brand at and the way they're interacting. Um, not to mention the years that that brand is founded in or the, the moment in time, right? We're talking so much about TikTok today. We're talking so much about social media today, which quite frankly, 10 years ago, that just was not the case. And many of these channels didn't exist. And if we're looking 10 years ahead, you know, where are those channels going to be? And what are those new channels that are going to be? And how is that going to evolve a marketing strategy for a brand? So I think... You know, from our perspective, both of our perspective, you know, we both believe that to achieve success, all the parts of the business really have to work together. And there's no such thing as a one size fits all. And like I said, on the marketing side, definitely not a one size fits all. Um, that's really even more so real with something like capital. So, Justin, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's funny because at ACG, we always talk about knowing the playbook for each category, whether that's prestige beauty at Sephora or building a pet food brand in independent pet retail. But the reality is there is no one playbook, even for a single category. And it's really a bespoke approach for each brand. And when we make an investment in a brand, you know, the areas that we want to lean in are a little bit different on each one. You know, one could be an ace marketers, but really need like a strong executive team. Others have like, you know, the team in place, but you know, our mess operationally. And so, um, and, you know, the other thing about where, and, and so when we come in, you know, we need to think about where to play, you know, what, what our capital is used for. Um, and it's really an agreement and a, a conversation with the founders coming in. And it, it always evolves over time as well. And, you know, just for a bit of additional context on ACG and the types of brands that we look at, you know, because we're looking for undisputed next gen winners in their category, Sometimes that's, you know, we're partnering very early on with founders, we're first institutional capital in the business, you know, brand examples of that would be like Clio Snacks, which Sabina's worked with as well, and is a Greek yogurt bar company, if you're not familiar. Um, but then we're also, you know, small investors in much larger brands like a Harry's or a Skims that are already household names, you know, long before we invest. And for them, the playbook looks looks very different. So it's all to say that, you know, capital can be the fuel on the fire, but um, it's always a, a different game of how it's used. And it depends on what the founders want, what we're looking for and where brands are in, in their life cycle. Yeah, 100%. Um, and you mentioned, you, you know, you mentioned working together. We we do quite a bit together. Um, we've had a, a long history of uh, of blending uh, the the side of marketing with capital, with announcements, with you know uh, investment announcements. Um, I think our first work together was on Crave. Um, we came in very very early on, before there was any capital in the business. Uh, we came in at the same time that they hired their first marketing uh, um, full-time person and uh, really took that brand and, and grew it uh, together. And it's been just wonderful to see how, you know, you can take this sort of challenger brand, you know, back in the day, 10 plus years ago and, you know, get to the Olympics and do partnerships with Sean White and Michael Phelps and Jillian Michaels and and how that changed and shifted over the years because that really uh, evolved so tremendously. And you mentioned Clio. Um, on the beauty side, uh, we did a, a great uh, announcement with Half Magic um, as well as uh, worked quite a little bit on, uh, on In Beauty. Uh, great brand at Sephora, really, really successful. Um, exclusive at Sephora for a very long time. And, and then, you know, obviously doing a ton of D2C um, but really interesting brand, really challenging, you know, two female founders that both came from very big beauty and just changed the dynamic of how beauty is looked at. And you don't need to buy a, you know, $150 jar of, you know, lotion or, you know, spot cream or something because on ultimately so much of that is marketing. So much of that is, um, so they're really trying to change that conversation. Um, and then Bark Thins, which, um, you know, has that, uh, um, very much a success story and, and has since sold um, very successfully. Um, so really kind of taking that, you know, I think all of these are great examples of how we've taken a 360 approach at integrating, whether it's 
um, something that's very D to C, like an in beauty or something that's that's you know very retail like Clio, right? So available at Walmart, available at Target, available at you know national national grocers, and really taking that approach of what does this brand really need? Um, how do you integrate with sales? How do you integrate marketing within that? How do you integrate with the strategy that the brand has for growth? Um, how do you drive awareness to a refrigerated product like a Clio versus a Bark Thins, which is easy, shelf stable, light to ship, completely different trajectory and completely different strategies. Um, but I think all of them have had sort of, you know, kind of, points of of distinction right all of them have had some sort of a brand spokesperson all of them have had tons of earned media and tons of of push behind that um i think all of them have had this unexpected event um as well as successful partnerships that that we've developed together and and have brought uh people to the table together um but i'd love your perspective a little bit because i think you guys do so much to love back brands and you guys do so much to, um, I mean, half magic is great. It's all, it's all celeb, right? <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about that and, and how that plays into, into capital and into the investment. Yeah, look, I mean, things have definitely changed in the, since the early days. And I think this slide's kind of a, a perfect example, right? Like, you know, Crave Jerky, uh, when we started working together, it's, that was, you know, more the traditional brand ambassador model. And right when celebrities were beginning to uh, become investors, but were far from the face of the brand. And, and nowadays, you know, it's it's completely changed with brands like Skims, which is our investment, Half Magic, which is um, for the, anyone who's not familiar, is founded by Donnie Davey, who is the um, makeup artist from Euphoria. Um, we've been part of brands like Way, which is Jen Atkin, who came to fame as the um, Kardashian's stylist. It's it's a whole different world, um, as everyone knows. But at the end of the day, uh, it it all comes back to product and brand and authenticity. I mean, our our view here at ACG is, you know, we've been part of plenty of celebrity backed brands, and those from the outside may even think of us as as celebrity uh, investors, but it all it all still comes back to, um, you know, whether you have a authentic brand story that resonates with consumer, like an outstanding product that outturns others on shelf, um, a differentiated, you know, kind of proposition and reason to be, and celebrity and marketing can uh, be the fuel on the fire, but it can't be the reason for being. And I know we'll, you know, we'll cover this a little bit later too, but it's definitely become a little bit of a, a cheat code uh, in a world where like digital marketing has gotten a lot harder, you know, a big megaphone like celebrity has become a way to, you know, combat increased CACs on Meta and Google, et cetera. But, um, but no, we've been, we've seen a big evolution over time and tried to evolve as ways of reaching consumers changed and um, have worked together with Connect in that and in, in, in terms of how to reach consumers and get as many eyeballs as possible on our brands. Yeah. And as, as you're talking about, about changes, yes, there's, there's obvious changes. Um, I was literally talking to somebody yesterday about linear TV and even the changes that, that that has had um, just in the last six months with the writer strike and how much that's affected linear, um, you know, content and content platforms emerging and how that's affecting, um, you know, where advertisers are really putting their money and how much money they're willing to put in a certain medium that also has changed dramatically. Um, but generally speaking, for, for the purposes of our conversation today, you know, there's been massive shift in, in even in the last five years, I'm not even going to say 10 years, um, competition is one of them, right? I mean, yeah. you, you no longer just have a challenger brand or two challenger brands, right? Like when we launched Crave, it was, there, there, were, there were two big guys selling jerky, and, and Crave was the first to challenge yep. that. Now, if you look on shelf, there's there's 10 jerky brands. Um, so competition is real, right? Um, I was I was talking to somebody at breakfast this morning about water brands, right? And what and what we're seeing with you know our friends at Liquid Death and how oh, yeah. insane, right? <laughs> yes. Like, do we want to talk about Liquid Death? Water and so many others that are like, you know, copying their branding, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so much. And and quite frankly, you can't, right? You can't. And like it's it's just innate to the brand. That brand itself was founded just on that marketing strategy. And that's it. And and nobody cares that it's water. They're not even talking about the fact that it's water at any point in time. Nobody says, Oh, I only drink liquid that because it's really the best. It's got electrolytes in this. No, nobody says that. They're like, This is a really cool water brand. I yeah, just love it. Exactly. <laughs> No, yeah. I mean, so, that, that's a good segue. I mean, we've, it's a hundred percent true. We see it with so many of our, our brands. I was just talking to someone yesterday about athletic brewing, which has really become a, a pioneer in the, in the non-alk beer set um, and has, has spawned a ton, a ton of, of imitators, but, you know, we still feel great about where athletics positioning because they've built you know, a moat around their brand, uh, you know, they, and more importantly, you know, they've, they've built several, uh, or two or three breweries on, on each coast, um, that allow them to stay ahead of the competition, but the competition is real. And I think connecting it back to, um, the capital side, um, you know, we've just seen a ton of capital flow into, um, the CPG space, especially in kind of the back half of last decade where we saw, you know, silic more traditional Silicon Valley venture funds like a light speed start doing consumer. And, you know, with the D to C boom, everyone started, you know, viewing, um, you know, consumer companies as tech companies. You had, you right. had big tech hedge funds like a D one or Lone Pine putting money in, in consumer companies. And, you know, now we're, we're coming out the other side of that a little bit. It's a different world where there's, higher interest rates, money isn't as cheap, the like the private equity fundraising markets tightened a lot, um, you know, demands from LPs, so like return capital is increased and and that's that's had pressure as well on, you know, term sheets, which is on on this slide in which anyone who's like an entrepreneur looking to raise capital has experienced where, you know, LPs might be demanding like maybe a little bit more strict controls, a little bit more downside protection, and just a little, you know, a little bit more discipline on valuation. And that's kind of a, you know, arguably a needed correction to where we were in kind of the back half of last decade and through 20 and 21 um, in terms of, um, yeah, what, what, is, what is reasonable to expect for um, the term sheet be between investor and brand. So there's been, you know, it's impossible to capture kind of what has changed on on a single slide here, but you know, beyond 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 the shifts in social and digital media, there's a ton that's changed in the capital side, and that affects how brands are able to invest in marketing and grow. Yeah, well, and on the marketing side, so much has changed in terms of of pricing and strategy. Like ultimately, that's what it comes down to: it's dollars and cents. You know, you have a Meta who you used to be able to place ads and spend a couple of thousand and be just fine and do really well. And now that is so competitive. You have to spend so much money to play. The barrier of entry is so much higher. Like that's just the reality. When you have a hundred advertisers all vying for the same term, then a thousand for the same term, then 10,000 for the same term. Like it's just a it, it's it's the market. It's just the way it is. It's driving it higher and it's making it impossible. And content has to be relevant. And then you can't develop the same content that you're developing talking about social and TikTok earlier. You can't develop the same content that you're developing for TikTok for YouTube, nor can you do YouTube for fit for Instagram or Facebook. So like the the division has become incredibly hard on brands, right? Because if you're a native digital brand right like if you're looking at somebody like skims right which i would call them digitally native yeah too right <laughs> I, they, they they live and breathe right and, and then you know kim shows up and you know half naked amazing sexy and then sells off like the entire you know the entire thing which by the way great brand right like an incredible brand but what they're doing is you know they're they're taking this this content they're taking the 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 visuals they're taking the imagery they're taking this aspirational model and they're selling it to as little as like my 13 year old daughter who's like mom i really think i should have skims i'm like you're getting none of that get out of here but that's that's what we're seeing right because of tiktok and because of how they're showcasing that content on tiktok and how attractive that is and the models look very much so on TikTok, 
younger. Um, so so there's there's a, a shift in in how the consumer is consuming that that content, but also what they're doing with it afterwards and how fast that information travels, right? Um, because I'm I'm sure you guys are seeing this on the sales side, you know. Kim posts up a, a a new video and like I remember when she posted about the um the loungewear, like I think it's sold out in like hours, yeah. if yeah. not sooner, which is crazy, right? Everybody wants that kind of effect on their yeah, brand. Everyone wants a yeah, a viral, viral moment, you know, like <laughs> like lipstick, phone, phone case comes to mind. But yeah, to your point, you know, everything is moving like faster, more viral, more specialized and it leads to like needing a more bespoke approach for everything because the competition is more intense, whether you're like on shelf, whether you're fighting for the buy box on Amazon, whether you're fighting for the ad space on Meta or Google. Um, and and yeah, everything just needs to be more more specialized, more viral, more, more everything. So um, more everything. <laughs> um, but so I, I actually have a, an interesting question for you because um, I never go to your website, which is, I mean, I don't know why I would go to your I website, but, you I've, yeah. <laughs> but I actually went to your website when we were working on this and I was like, let me go to their website and see what their website does. And, and I thought it was really, really interesting because um, right when you go to the website, there is this, this, um, idea of of you guys positioning yourselves as, as storytellers and of having a story to tell about the brands that you work with um and we always say that that's what we do best that even though yes we do social and yes we do influencer and yes we do all this other tactics ultimately the story and the story that connects the consumer to the brand is what's going to sell and if you're not able to share that story in a meaningful way then you're not going to build a meaningful connection with the consumer so Talk to me about storytelling a little bit. Yeah, so I think if I recall what it says on our website, I think it's that we we have a front row seat to to all the mm -hmm. all the you know amazing brand stories or something something like yep. that. Yeah, yeah. I think the the word like front row seat is important because it's not it's not our story. We're not placing ourselves at the at the center of the story because the story is always about the brand and the and the entrepreneur and and how everything fits together. I mean, as a you know as an investor like. You know, there's a whole alchemy of things that make a brand, you know, attractive to ACG. It has to have like really great growth, really, you know, strong unit economics, really great, you know, velocities. But it always comes back to like the magic combo of like products, founder, brand, which all have to work um, in perfect concert with one another. And that comes back to the story. So, you know, whenever we're meeting an entrepreneur for the first time, it's it always you know, our first question is always about, you know, tell us the story from the very beginning. How, you know, how does a uh, how does it connect? And I think that athletic brewing is probably a, a great example of that. So, you know, this the story is pretty well known at, at this point for for anyone who who doesn't, you know, it was founded by um a guy named Bill Schufelt, who was working on Wall Street, uh, but also an avid athlete and outdoorsman who found that, you know, he was going out a lot, drinking a lot, and couldn't keep up with his busy lifestyle. And so he wondered, like, why can't anyone create like a good non-alcoholic beer that would still taste like beer and give you a lot of the benefits, but not uh, make you hungover the next day? And so long story short, he, you know, went to hundreds of brewers, got laughed out of the room by 99 out of 100 of them, but finally met this guy named John Walker, who he, who's a master brewer, and together they kind of um saw this huge market opportunity um invented a new brewing process in which you know most out almost all alcoholic non-alc beers they burn off the alcohol at the end and therefore like burn off a lot of the flavor um but they created a new uh process that was brewed without alcohol from scratch uh and so that created a better product so they named it athletic brewing um you know, to kind of mimic the outdoor lifestyle, they, you know, they they went and sampled at, you know, not just farmers markets, but also uh, marathons and cycling races and ski resorts and sporting events to kind of build the the grassroots consumer base. And you know, today it's it's become you know a hundred million dollar plus brand, the you know the number one non-alc beer in the U.S., surpassing big guys like Heineken Zero Zero and 
actually it's the number 10 craft brewery uh, in the US, uh, you know, ALK or non-ALK. And it really comes down to like that super authentic founder story, you know, a rabid consumer base that loves it uh, and kind of this core of like athletic outdoorsy consumers there. And it's a, it's a mission driven brand too. They still, you know, um, donate 2% of their sales to their two for the trails initiative. So it goes to conservation. Um, so I think it's a good example of like, you know, what, of how it, it all links together. Like for, for athletic, it's about the story and the brand and the products. And for ACG, it's, it's about that and the market opportunity. Right. So mm -hmm. part I left out is that, you know, the U S beer market is a hundred billion dollars. Um, you know, in the non-ALK before athletic was sub 1% of the market, but what Bill and John and ACG saw is that, um, you know, in Europe, uh, like markets like Germany or Spain, non-ALK beer was as much as 5% or 10% of the overall beer market. And so, you know, if they could replicate that in the US, if it could become even three or four or 5% and athletic could capture an outsized share of the market, um, then that was a massive opportunity. And so that was what made it really exciting for us as an investor, in addition to the story and the brand and the best in class products. And, you know, they're, they're well on their way um, to, you know, creating that storybook ending, not there yet, but um, kind of, it's been, a, it's been an amazing journey so far. So. And they're, I mean, they're a great company. Aside from the, the story of the founder, I think what they also have going for them is the sort of new couple of generations, I'm not just going to say Gen Z, but just generally speaking, the latest generations who are really not looking at alcohol the way, you know, our generations have, yeah. right? Um, you know, we sort of grew up with our parents having drinks in the house and, you know, we are raising kids and, you know, we're usually having drinks in the house and that's definitely shifting. I wouldn't say as much as the media is making it shift, um, but it's definitely shifting and it's shifting in a, in just like you said, right? Like people are super into workouts. People are into, you know, lifestyle. People want to make sure that, you know, they don't wake up foggy the next morning, that they have like a really good or, or their careers or, you know, they want to make sure that whatever they're dedicating their time and energy to isn't in a state that is anything subpar or anything sub a hundred percent. And we're, we're seeing that. And I think, you know, ABC saw that and was like, hey, there's there's an interest here in this market. But I think the product itself is, is what speaks. And I think this is important too. Like, yes, there's a market for this. And yes, there's, there's a story to it. But the product really has to do the lift. Because ultimately, if I go down the street, and I always tell clients this, if I go down the street and I ask 100 people, do you want to try this product? And people go, yeah, I don't know. I'm like, that sounds weird. I don't, I don't, I don't even know what half the stuff is in it. And just because it's healthy or better for you, it doesn't necessarily matter. The product has to do the lift on its own. When you have a beer that looks like a beer, that tastes like a beer, which ABC does, yeah. um, and, and it smells like a beer and it looks like one, it, it's, it's nice and beautiful and frothy and yellow, and it's not water, um, then you go, oh, this is really cool. Like I, I can totally get behind this product. This tastes really good and it doesn't make me feel all wonky. So this is awesome. Um, and I think that means, needs to be part of the strategy right is is how do you let the product shine whether it's through you know the money that's invested in it or through the marketing that you're doing but that product has to be able if you're putting it down the street right like we all remember the good honesty uh you know times when they would do literally in the middle of the street they would do little boots and it was like you know drop a dollar or drop however much and you can take a tea and people were lining up to get it not just because it was however much you wanted to put in but because it was actually a really delicious product people were like oh i really like this this is good I'm all about drinking that. So when you're when you're able to bring the product into the forefront and let the product live on its own, right? I mean, talking about skims earlier, right? If the product wasn't good, like people wouldn't line up for a sale. Like exactly. they just wouldn't. People would never buy it again. And the repeat customer is what you're going for. You're not going for the guy that's buying it once and never again. You're going for that customer that's buying it on repeat.
Exactly. No, and that's that's why it has to be all of the, the above. You know, I think Clio is another good example of that, right? Where it's like amazing founder story founded by a you know Ukrainian immigrant yeah. in his in his garage who creates this Greek yogurt bar that has this amazing like cheesecake like texture, but you know it. it you know, be, it, it's a great product and it's delicious, but it does require a little bit of explanation because 99% of people who try it, like have never had a Greek right. yogurt bar before, right? And so right. that plays into marketing, right? And how you want to invest right. uh, the dollars, right? Because it may require like sampling or demos at Costco or a little bit of explanation into, you know, explaining right. exactly what it's, what it is um, or how it works. But once you have that, if there's a great product at the core, then- um, and consumers try it, they love it, then they go back to Walmart or Whole Foods or wherever to buy it, um, then that's how you really create that momentum for, for the brand. Yeah, and, and addiction to the product, right? <laughs> um, so we wanted to dive in into, into some of the questions that we, we get asked. Obviously, we're talking about a lot of brands, um, both that we work on and that we don't work on, as, uh, as you can see. Um, but I think one of the things that, that we always get asked, um, you know, on, on, at least for me, is how how can I be them, right? And, and we mentioned Liquid Death earlier, and I think so many brands are like, they're doing great, we should do the same. And I'm probably in, you know, 50 meetings uh, at any point in time where people are like, oh, I really think we should copy Liquid Death. This is so great. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> like, like we said in the beginning, one playbook doesn't necessarily work for all playbooks. And, and I think we get asked this question like, well, you guys did work on this. How do we get that? And 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 it's it, it. I wish that it was that simple. I wish that uh, that you could just write it all in, and it works every single time like magic. Um, and yes, there's a playbook, um, but that playbook gets so adapted and redacted so often. Um, and the strategies that that would work for one brand at a certain time um, may not necessarily work for another brand at a certain time because they don't have the same cachet. Um, and and like I personally have had brands that have worked with Kim and have had her as a spokesperson. And the reality is that those brands never got to what a Skims is getting just because it's different. It's not the same intention it's not the same brand ethos it's not the same functionality and that just doesn't work the same way even though it's the same person the same kim did this ad and this brand and then the same kim went to skims and did the, an ad and a, and a brand promo and it just didn't work the same so that's probably one of the questions that we get asked absolutely the most um and then probably talking about celebs is you know do we do a celebrity partner? I got asked the breakfast that. Do we do a celebrity partner? And if so, here's a list of our required celebrity partners that we think we should partner with because it will be great for us. Um, and and again, that's a that's a question that I think uh, every brand has to answer on their own. And and some products make a lot of sense with a celebrity partner, um, and some brands don't make any sense with a celebrity partner. And you sometimes look at partnerships and you go, hmm, what happened there? What why are these people doing this? Because this makes no sense. Um, and then finally, we get asked a lot about like silver bullets, right? Like what's the one thing we can do that just is going to catapult us to success? Um, and I don't necessarily know that that works that way. And you mentioned earlier, just the virality and uh, that that's, that's, you know, that's almost like a four letter word because it's like, oof, no, we're not gonna, it's five, but we're not gonna go viral. Chances of going viral are, uh, you, don't, you don't ask to go viral when you go viral. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm sure you, you get, you get some, some of these questions too, just in a different, uh, in a different theme. Yeah, yeah, no, ab absolutely. I mean, it's like everyone, everyone always asks us about skims or skims probably most often these days. And it's like, you know, brands are always one of a kind and it's always, it's always different for, for each. Um, but I guess switching gears to just kind of the questions, questions we get as, as investors and in a growth equity firm. Uh, the first one is just, you know, this is a kind of a catch all founders are always asking us like, when should we raise? Should we like delay a raise? Should we, you know, there, cause everyone's so folk, but I think the overarching theme is that people always tend to be focused on valuation kind of above all. Right. And so like, yeah that's kind of the the undertone to the questions of like, oh, should we like 
punt the, especially these days, it's like, oh, should we punt the fundraise six months for like when the market might be better in six months and we might be able to, to get a higher valuation. But, uh, you know, the answer investors and we always give is like higher valuation isn't always better. It might be less dilutive. It, it is a market signal, of course, but it's, it sets expectations for your next round. It, it, it's something you may not be able to necessarily live up to if it's if it's way too high. And more importantly, you need to think about like what's right for your business, like what's the right timing, who's the right partner, uh, et cetera. And that's kind of a good segue into the to the next question, which is, uh, you know, how involved are we? What do, what's our what's our value add? What's our point of difference from from other firms? And I think the answer, it goes back to, you know, the bespoke approach is that it is it is different for every brand because every brand's needs are different, right? So like a, a Harry's or a Skims has very different needs from a Clio or a Half Magic or a brand that's a bit earlier stage on on the day we invest. But we're we're there to help with whatever we need, whether it's introduction to great PR agencies or uh, banks for or lenders or distributors, brokers or operating partners. Um, Etc. And then I think the the last question we get this question, you know, kind of all the time is is just about um, D to C only and what's our view on digitally native brands and uh, you know we're investors in many digitally native brands like like a Harry's or or Skims um, but we've always been huge believers in in omni channel and you know for example we when we invested in Harry's the reason was we were excited was because they were going into target with these huge end caps and and displays and with the full weight of kind of target uh behind them and you know since then they've really become a leader in not just target but walmart and many other and drug and other many other um retailers and so um and i think we are kind of um past the heydays of like the d to c only boom right it's a yeah it's a distribution channel not a not a way of building a business or something to build a build a brand on. And I think that, you know, hopefully we've been proven like long term, we may have been short term wrong, but long term right here. And that, you know, there are diminishing returns to like acquiring customers online and paying ever higher CACs and trying to play that game. And for us as an investor, um, you know, not all revenue is is created equal. Like, yes, it's fantastic if you like can get to $25 million of of online revenue and you feel really really strong in your model and if you have greater unit economics then absolutely continue acquiring customers online but it's going to get harder and you know if you have 15 million of d2c revenue and 10 million of sephora revenue that tells us something fundamentally different about the business because it means you're like able to attract them on shelves you know how to manage a retail uh, relationship you know how to you know execute in sales and at retail you may be bringing in a different customer than the one you're attracting online so um i'd say that's a that's a very very common we question question we get that you know relates to marketing and and capital yeah and i think skims just did recently in the last year i think they went into nordstrom's right yeah i think you know i they've been partnered with nordstrom since very early or maybe on. or same maybe with, a little with, Good American, which is their sister brand, Chloe's brand. Right. Like we invested in that before Skims in kind of early 2019. And at the time, like, you know, they were significantly e-com, but they've always had great partnerships with Nordstrom for one and, and many other department stores. I mean, apparel's a little bit different in the sense that like, you know, you don't want to, there's not as many doors as there are in like, you know, grocery retail or mass retail for a for a food or personal care brand or or something like that. But um, but yes, they were both were already kind of in wholesale, um, if not the day we invested, then shortly after. Yeah. And and look, I think there's there's tremendous value. And yes, the customer is more expensive, um, but it's also first party data, which in yeah. a you know cookieless world and 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 brands should always think about how am I going to get 
my first party data because ultimately you're never going to get retailer data to the level that you need it to in order to model your audience and to know your audience and audience studies are extremely expensive um not to mention they take a long time not to mention ultimately you're, you're kind of finding out what you already were supposing right like if it's a no. you know femme brand like chances are you're going to find what you're going to, what you expect. Like, yeah, they're likely, you know, 29 to, you know, 45 and they live in highly urban societies and this and that. So uh, all like ultimately those audience studies aren't necessarily as eye-opening as one thinks. Sometimes they are, but not always. Um, but D2C has, has this unique value of interacting with the customer and the brands that use it in the right way not only are they getting that first party data, but they're also spending the time and the energy in building that relationship with the consumer and building them as brand advocates, almost no different than you would build with an influencer platform. How are you building that relationship with a customer in a way where you're receiving feedback, where they become really brand warriors for you, um, where they're standing up for you in front of others. And when you know, sometimes things do happen to brands and things aren't great, you know, sideline crisis. Those people aren't, are the first to jump to your help. When yes. you've built that relationship with them and when you've built the trust with the brand, then those are the first people to be like, hey, you need to calm down. We we literally had a crisis last week and um, the, the brand was very concerned about the uh, feedback that they were going to receive. They're a very, very tight-knit brand with their customers. Their customers came to their love and appreciation and their help in front of Facebook groups, closed Facebook groups that we could see. Um, they came on social and they were like, hey, everybody needs to put their pitchforks down. Like, you don't really need to jump on this brand. They've never done anything bad. Things like this happen. Um, yes, it's not ideal that it happened, but things do happen. So give them a little slack, you know, give them a little grace. And it was really wonderful to see how when that D2C, and that was all because of their D2CR, right? Because they filled this like super tight knit community of people that are on their newsletter, that are, yep. you know, reading their, their social posts, that are interacting with their social posts. And when push came to shove, they came to their help, which was really awesome. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, yeah, not to take away from the value of D to C at all. It's incredibly important for exactly as you said, driving loyalty or subscriptions or marketing, and it's it's uh it's 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 really valuable from those perspectives. So uh, we'll 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 land on on sort of two two topics here uh, that Justin and I called elephant in the room. Um, so I'll talk about the elephant in the room uh, that that relates to to AI and uh, and he'll give his perspective on that, um, and then I'll let Justin talk a little bit about kind of the elephant in the room, aka capital partner, and how uh, you know there's there's definitely. Uh, a lot of talk on on how do you really pick the right capital partner and what are some of the things that you should be looking out for when when that happens. Um, so when it comes to AI, it, it's not a matter of 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 how much of it, but it's a matter of how to use it. I think um, when you look at PR and PR alone, right? Um, people use uh, AI right now to to disseminate information, and and I think that that's that's great, and that should be the way to do it. Um, just as a thought on on how to do it, I think it's more of using it as a starting point versus using it as a copywriter. Um, so, you know, using AI and chat GBT to copyright your press releases and copyright your uh, social posts, probably not the best idea, uh, mainly because this is crowdsourced information and copyright and trademark and all of these other um, things that one should be aware of when they're posting things on behalf of a brand um, can be an, an, an but, you know, a, a little bit of an issue. Um, so I think utilizing it is is great. And like our teams use it all the time for idea starters or for, you know, aggregating ideas or for thinking beyond what they may not be thinking about. Um, even putting decks together where they're like, oh gosh, what am I forgetting here? There's like 15 things that I want this client to do. What am I forgetting out here? And I think 
that's important to use and that's the right way to use it. Um, you know, when people are literally regurgitating uh, chat GPT content, it's, it's very visible. Um, and again, going back to that brand loyalty and going back to, to that conversation that we were having literally a minute ago about how to build that, that tight knit community, um, people expect to be talked to by people and people expect to be building a relationship with a brand that has people behind it. Um, and it's super, super important to create that relationship in a way where, and especially on social media, where you have this, this uh, ability to really liaise with that person on a one-on-one -on -one level, and that doesn't come from AI. Again, the, the ideas can come from there. Um, even some language can come from there. Um, the, the upping of the, of the level can come from there. And coming up with with better things that you may not have thought of um, can come from there, but but the the you know copy and paste uh, is something that is and can be extremely tricky. Um, you know the other the the other piece that that I think is is really important is when it comes to creative and image creation through AI. Um, I was just at a conference last week and uh, the, you know, the lady that was presenting on stage was like, oh, here's what uh, I've had AI create for me. And, and she went through this entire deck of images that, that were created. And it was really interesting to see how much, um, how much imagery was, was actually really trademarked and copywritten that really shouldn't be in a public uh, forum of uh, somebody's uh, deck or a brand's deck or a brand campaign. Um, so those are just things to to look out for. Again, inspiration is amazing. The ability to craft images with AI is is incredible. Um, and and again, our team uses that all the time. Uh, just that ability to like really make it your own and and double check and triple check that something you're using isn't isn't being used something else, somewhere else or a brand hasn't already trademarked that or um, you know there's no litigation behind it. I mean, there's there's a ton of reasons why one should double, triple check, um, but those just come, some of them and how to kind of use that to your advantage versus not. Yeah, 100% uh, agreed. I think it's it's a buzzword, but it always goes back to authenticity, right? You know, and are you are you speaking to your consumer on, on their level and not from, you know, on high? And I think con consumers are too smart to not know the difference, right? Um, so yeah. I, that's that on the PR and creative side. I mean, on on the on the you know the right half of the slide, it's like I think we're in the very early innings um, of of like how brands are going to use it to you know target consumers more effectively, make personalized recommendations, and like even like on the inside, you know, just drive, be more efficient about like you know utilizing all the data that they get from their D2C websites to, you know, drive product innovation, you know, launch new marketing campaigns, um, et cetera. But I think we, we shall see it depend at different categories within consumer also move at different paces, right? Like beauty often tends to, and digitally native brands tend to be much more on the cutting edge of these things than, um, food and beverage, for example. Um, so yeah. It, it, I think it kind of remains to be seen, but, um, you know, it's, this is going to be kind of the next big secular shift. Um, if the last five years were all about, you know, digital marketing and social media and, you know, TikTok is the moment right now, I think there's, there's another wave to come. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely seeing a lot of that personalization. In, in the ad sets and the ability to really target consumers with different messages um, or even able to, to really, you know, geo-target very small markets um, where you, you're able to really kind of target that ad and have a completely different ending for the ad. So even on video where, you know, you'll know the IP addresses of, you know, X amount of people in this area. So you're like kind of targeting that area and then you go, oh, great, then we'll serve this end of the ad. And that makes more sense than this other you know, group here that is getting a completely different ad. So while the ad may look the same 70%, the last 30% and the CTA is usually completely different. So we're seeing a, a ton of personalization, even beyond, you know, kind of me product, me this, offer me something that's only interesting to me, um, you know, send me a Postmates offer that's only interesting to me, but actually taking that even a step further and actually trying to, to drive a different uh, call to action. 
Um, okay. Um, capital partners, the other yeah. elephant in the room. Yeah. I'll try, I'll try and keep this short because I wanna I I know we um we want to leave time for questions at the end, but you know, talked about on the three question slide some of the misconceptions, but want to just quickly run through a bunch of other questions that that we always get and things that brands should be thinking about when assessing capital partners. So first is like who the partner is and and what do you what do you want? Because, you know, like we've been saying, there's a ton of capital, there's a ton of competition, right? You could take money from a VC, from a family office, from a growth equity firm, from a, uh, you know, a large investor <laughs> or a small investor, from a family office, from a corporate venture fund, from friends and family, right? So there's many different ways to, to raise money, right? And it depends on like, you know, do you want a partner who's super involved? Do you want industry expertise, but it it's truly about what you want. It's not to say that specialists like ACG are always better than than generalists. You know, there's if you want the network of a of a venture firm or something like that, there could be could be value there. But it's important to know that going in and and really set yourself up for success because it's it's entering a it's entering a marriage. You know, you're the partners alongside you for you know, the next stage of your business, whether that's three years or five years or or seven years until exit. And you want to make sure you have the right um, the right partner um, who you feel free to call. And I think that's even more important as like, you know, going back to how ACG is involved when we're minority partners. And that speaks to kind of investor founder clashes on this slide. Um, it's like, who and how many investors do you want on your cap table? And you know, mm -hmm. you have to have, you have to be marching to the same beat at the end of the day, right? And it could be simpler with one partner, but if you believe there's value in multiple partners, then that's a way to approach things too. But the way we try and approach things at ACG is always trying to like, you know, play nice in the sandbox because we're minority investors, right? We're only as useful as you want us to be. We're happy to show up just at quarterly board meetings if that's what you want. And you can call us every day or every week uh if that's what you want and sometimes <laughs> we're like coming you know we're along for the ride with you and um and and so you know we have to play nice with you but also if there's other investors on the cap table and in the boardroom whether that's my, some of your early investors who we come in after or whether that's a larger sponsor that um may come in after us um and i think that goes for for the last thing on the page which is timeline to to exit as well um like it's always a a conversation it always needs to be driven by like yes we are investors and we need to make a return for our investors eventually but it should be on the right timeline for you and for the brand and like you know the consumer world is um can be fickle right it's like sometimes you know we may invest before an idea like has its time in the sun right and so like but three years later now like you know that trend is the hottest thing in the industry and and that's the and the, and that might take that might be seven years into our investment period and maybe that's when like you get knocks on the door from strategics or it's the right time to sell the business so um it's important to like from the founder perspective to just be you know aligned with your partners on um timeline and what you want for the business and you know what's the five-year plan and the 10-year plan but it's always going to be an evolving conversation based on things that are both within your control and then things that are out of your control be it consumer trends or um you know market conditions or or what have you very true um okay um i am gonna stop sharing and we'll answer some questions Okay, we do have a question here. Um, what a AI apps do you recommend creative PR and marketing? Oh, yeah, there's a long list. Um, I can, if you send me an email or a DM on, on LinkedIn, I'll give you a list of the ones that we use, uh, a, 
Adobe does, you know, have their own, has their own creative app that we've, that we've been playing around with. Um, and the office suite has an AI app that, that we've been playing around with uh, again for texting and writing and emailing and a lot faster kind of content writing, um, obviously chat that, that you're using. Uh, but there's, there's a ton of, of apps out there that are, that are great. I'll give you a list of the five to seven that we use. And just a reminder, uh, following this call, we will be sharing the contact information of our panelists in addition to the presentation and some other materials. So um, you'll see that shortly. Um, is there anyone else that has a question they'd like to ask the panelists? Feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, drop it in the chat. You're just so thorough. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, in, while everyone's thinking about that, I'm just going to quickly drop some information in the chat as well. Um, there's a lot, obviously, going on here at Naturally New York. And uh, tonight, we're actually hosting an Earth Week party in, in partnership with Bigpreneur. So if you would like to attend, it's from 530 to 830 at Shopify. You can receive complimentary access using promo code NNY member at checkout. We're also hosting our next networking event, our Spring Fling, May 1st. So there's some details there about that. Um, we are also sourcing applications for our Pitch Slam, which is going to be our biggest event of the year. We're expecting over 300 people to attend the Metropolitan Pavilion on Thursday, June 13th uh, from 4.30 to 6.30. And eligibility requirements and all that is, is in the link there that's uh, dropped in the chat. We'll also route this via email following the call. Um, and details haven't been shared about this yet, but we are having dedicated pavilions at both the Founder Made Innovation Show on June 6th and at the Summer Fancy Food Show. So at a very efficient rate, might I add. So I hope that, um, you know, brands will take advantage of that and please help spread the word that, you know, all of these opportunities are available and we are working vigorously behind the scenes to make magic happen. So <laughs> I appreciate everyone's support in participating and spreading the word, yes. Um, Thank you, Adrienne. Of course. But before we wrap up, is there any other questions for our panelists? I think everyone's good. Yeah. Well, thank you all for awesome. joining us again today. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful thank afternoon. You.